If you thought that so far in our journey you had begun to understand what it means to coexist or be a part of the grim reality of life in the 41st millennium, then I should warn you that in actuality we have barely begun to scratch the surface. Also I will mention that this faction of the Imperium is significantly unpleasant, so if you are easily disturbed, maybe skip this one. The Emperor of Mankind stands as a figure of all human strength. Their hopes, dreams, spirit, and above all else their supreme protector. While all the forces of the Imperium of Man carry out their actions in the name of the Emperor, there are those whose actions are so extreme that they wander very closely to being beyond the line of acceptable human actions. Not because so much the level of their violence, but more because of how disturbing and fanatical their behaviour is, even blurring the lines between worship of the Emperor and worship of the darkness that envelops them. Many death cults exist within humanity in the 41st millennium, and likely many more exist that are as yet undiscovered. They bring murder, suffering to any who fall within their grasp, and these cults will kill by a chosen rationale, usually a distorted rationale at that. Often this can be for any number of chosen reasons, anything such as age, gender, race, even something as seemingly innocent as the hair colour of an individual. It could be that a victim has a pronounced faith for the Emperor, or maybe a lack of it. The one certainty is that these attributes will not exist within the cult. These death cults and death cult assassins though are not to be confused with assassination cults, who do not discriminate in their victims as the death cults would, and they will target any person as it is not their attributes they seek to extinguish, but the act itself. The assassination cults are often more secular in nature, and I'm actually using that correctly this time, and have little if any worship for the emperor, in stark contrast to many death cults whose entire doctrines are based around worshipping the emperor through their actions. The main difference between a death cult and an assassination cult is that the death cult will be highly ritualistic, whereas the assassination cult's entirely pragmatic. Those who excel at the art of murder are those known as the assassins of the death cults. These uncommon shadowy figures carry out decadently brutal actions in the name of the Emperor, and belong to the extreme fringes of the Imperial cult, that is, the religious worship of the Emperor of Man. These death cults often reference their origin to times when the Emperor still walked as a man. The Emperor's Blades cult, for example, talk of a great battle against the darkness of chaos on Akanon. After millions had died in this slaughter, the Emperor is reported to have said that the blood of martyrs is the seed of humanity's future. These words would inspire the actions of many death cultists. The Imperial cult itself is enforced by the Ecclesiarchy, it serves not to simply call for the worship of the Emperor, but to practically, through his worship, bind humanity and aid in its strength. In the endless darkness that humanity finds itself, there are those who have pledged to seek out and burn away the darkness, to remain autonomous and incorruptible. This order is known as the Inquisition. These defenders guard the souls of humanity against the darkest forces that endlessly try to corrupt and destroy the very soul of mankind. The Inquisition's authority is absolute and answers to no power other than the Emperor himself. This independent autonomy, however, has led to the Inquisition becoming highly convoluted in regards to its philosophical outlooks and is split into many factions. Some of these factions are more Puritan in nature, while others are more radical, even borderline heretical. Ultimately though, the Inquisition's role is to seek out and exterminate Xenos, mutants and heretics with extreme prejudice. And to that end, they employ whatever tools and weapons are necessary to achieve their objectives. Some of these tools take human form, such as the Arco-Flagellant, or the focus for us, the nightmarish Death Cult Assassins. The Death Cult Assassins are not officially trained by the Imperium, nor to be part of the Inquisition, you see. They are literally, as the name describes, a cult of death. To some humans in the Imperium, their beliefs and worship of the Emperor have become so fanatical, so extreme, and arguably delusional, that they have come to believe that simply inflicting wounds of any size or severity, that killing in and of itself, 
is very much a religious action, all contributing to the worship of the emperor. They rationalise it as a sacrificial act in the same spirit of the emperor's sacrifice at the end of the Horus heresy. Not all of the death cults are aligned with the Imperium either, as these literal worshippers of death and bloodshed often have strayed over the line into the attentions of the Chaos Gods and unwittingly followed a path that led to their worship of the Chaos God of Blood, Corn. To the death cults, inflicting bloodletting and harrowing wounding pays artistic homage to that which underlies the true nature of humanity, and that only endless bloodshed will spiritually lead humanity to prevail in such a nightmarishly hostile galaxy. For these cultists, each tear of flesh, each rip and penetration of a blade or instrument is worship of the Emperor. These ideals are what make the dark cults of death some of the most dangerous encountered by the Inquisition. However, their extreme loyalty and devotion to the Emperor also enable them to become instruments of his power, and for the cultists, such enlistment by the Inquisition is truly a blessing. The assassins are often depicted as female, but it is understood they can be male or female. Most notable death cult assassins have been female though, so perhaps they are simply better suited to this elegantly vicious art form as they see it. Some death cults originated from fairly ordinary practices of private mercenary work and bounty hunting, and over time, fueled by sprawling trade wars, these mercenary groups evolved into more of a guild of assassins, having refined their skills as murderers and saboteurs. It seems logical that they would spiral down in this way, and cults like this often do care more for healthy finances, even more than they do their religious fervour, given their background. The death cultists, though, are used by the Inquisition regardless of their background or motivations, even those in the assassination cult, because they always display adept skill in eradicating the enemies of the Emperor. They are infiltrators, masters of pain, and skillful executioners. If you were to become a target of a death cult assassin, and you can think of an unpleasant means of death, you have not thought about it intricately enough. Death cult assassins see their work as an art form an imaginative display of death and suffering. Bladed rings, needles, throwing blades, dermatomes, sharpened stilettos, wire, whips, rotary tools, digi-weapons, which are miniaturised versions of imperial weapons often contained within rings, even artistic blades crafted from the literal bones of the faithful or heretical are all in their inventory. And whatever you might be able to imagine is the worst that can be inflicted upon you, it's not even close. The agony-inducing suffering inflicted by the death cult assassins is not at all random or sadistic though, often it can even be fast. Their murders are artistic rituals. In some respect, this is all the more terrifying. They seek no pleasure and simultaneously will show no mercy, sympathy or pity. When they arrive for you, all you'll be sure of is that this is going to happen. For them, each surface wound, each precise laceration or piercing of skin, open gaping wounds, punctured organs, holds a specific significance in attributing the individual's soul to the Emperor. Also, just if you are wondering, death cultists are also frequently cannibalistic, hollowing the bones of their victims, consuming the marrow, and bathing in as well as drinking the blood of their potentially still living victims. They will skillfully separate skin from flesh, nerve from muscle, deconstructing their chosen victims. They believe this to be a purifying process, and that in consuming their flesh of their victim, they take into themselves an enemy's strength, spirit, really any prowess. They may also siphon and preserve the blood or offerings of their victims, and return them to the Great Cathedral to present their gift to the Emperor himself. These more depraved habits and actions are often overlooked by Inquisitors, who prize them for their immensely brutal and efficient skill in disposing of the enemies of the Emperor. To become a member of a death cult, some only allow this through a hereditary process, and so only those born into the cult are allowed to learn the ways of them. The cultist actions become stranger still though, in that some do not use audible speech and instead remain in total silence, only communicating to one another through sign language. The origins and reasons for this are not known, however the silence only exacerbates the agonising cries of their victims and the sounds of blades upon bone. Others may be headhunted to be brought into individual cells. Those cultists who have chosen to indulge in the acts of cannibalism may have unpleasantly sharpened teeth to enable them to better devour their victims, 
They may even replace their jaws with cybernetically enhanced metal versions. They will often also carry extra tools like marrow spoons and brain forks. The higher ranking members may have grinders for limbs and special flesh stripping tools. They may even go as far as to modify their digestive system with additional tanks of bile and stomach acid to allow them to more quickly digest their consumed victims. The faceless death cultists originate from paranoic fears during the Age of Apostasy and their subsequent purges of entire planets for heresies. Their distorted origin of paranoia leads their perspective to want to exist as anyone and simultaneously no one. They mentally and physically remove any sense of individual by both surgical alterations and brain scrubbing. The cultists may regularly go so far as to appear faceless by removing their skin, noses, ears, even eyes. They remove any physical sense of self and their appearance can often be stitched, stretched or unpleasantly even loose having been detached, reattached, consequently significant muscle nerve damage occurring. These parodies of humanity, these creatures can barely be described and truly they achieve their goal of being faceless and representing no one. Some of the death cults have a very practical belief in their actions, they are known as resurrectionists. They believe that the Emperor will come again and that his broken shell of a body will be filled with divine will, that his spirit will return and he will once again lead mankind in a great crusade. They are one of the more heretical death cults and believe that rites and rituals can imbue the Emperor's body with spirit. These groups tend to attract the more disturbed and broken individuals and these cults are widely hated so they live in darkness lest they be purged and eradicated by the Inquisition, the Ministerum, even the Mechanicus. The necrophagic death cults are another example of a foul and heretical alignment. These cults often appear on planets stricken by famine or plague, and they exploit people's panic and desperation, turning them into ritualistic sacrifice, cannibalism, even disturbing necrotic acts. Many members of the necrophagic cult are entirely broken individuals long since having lost their rational senses and are beyond redemption. These cults are never tolerated by any imperial authority, even the Inquisition, and are actively eradicated wherever they are found. The more common cults are the sanguinary cults, and these are, as the name suggests, more focused purely on killing and bloodletting by extravagant means. These are more tolerated and sometimes turned a blind eye to by authorities, mainly due to their exceptional devotion to the Emperor and their pure hatred for his enemies. The sanguinary death cults are usually the origin of assassins who would aid the Inquisition and the Adeptus Ministerum. They can be found anywhere from feral planets to the darkest recesses of hive worlds. They're even to be found in noble courts, anywhere that humans exist in numbers, enabling them to carry out their rituals with deadly elegance. Some death cults do not operate with the comparable organisation of a guild or clan. There are some who operate more as singular operating cells, and these are led by a mistress or master who will have recruited them from the dark corners of hives, war zones and feral worlds. Individuals chosen may already have suffered some form of mental break or personal tragedy, leading them to be more open to follow the dark and often depraved path of the death cult. These individuals who are often young will be moulded to use their rage, resentment, bitterness and hate to spill blood in the name of the Emperor and become a harbinger of death. If they survive and pass their initial training they'll be sent out to perfect and hone the art of murder without mercy, pity or remorse. One such death cult assassin is Seraph, an acolyte of Inquisitor Antonia Mesmeron. She was mind wiped and so knows little about herself before her time as a death cult assassin. This brainwashing was imbued upon her as a result of possession by a demon. Her salvation only allowed because of the Inquisitor's ablationist outlook. At the core of an ablationist belief is the sense that the power of the immaterium is corrupting without exception. Ablationists see your life choice as being between damnation and service to the Emperor. And so to that end you are left with the choice of remaining impotent and pure or being willing to make choices like using the weapons of the dark enemy. They believe that others outside of their faction should not use these dark powers and only those who have chosen this path of self-annihilation may take up weapons of the enemy to turn their power against them. In doing so they understand that their lives are essentially forfeit and their souls ruined, but a sacrifice they are ready to make for the god emperor of mankind. 
Seraph had previously been part of the Moratak cult who used the aforementioned single cell operation. She is highly feared as being both an Inquisition acolyte and a death cultist. Seraph uses weapons known as lathe blades upon her targets, and these rare blades are fashioned from alloys that are only able to be forged due to gravitic properties of the region where they are produced. The result of this is a blade with immense strength and an extremely fine edge, allowing incisions and cuts of instantaneous depth and precision. Their properties though remaining simultaneously flexible enough to resist breaking even under a shattering blow, even strong enough to resist damage by a power field. The reputation of lathe blades' desirable properties is such that some officers and officials in the Imperium favour them over other similarly uncommon power weapons. For Seraph though, due to her Chaos possession and subsequently tainted soul, she is now branded with the Mark of Chaos upon her face, which will undoubtedly only amplify the terror in her victims, being that it will likely be the last symbol they will look upon. The Death Cult Assassins represent one of the darker fringes of human society within the Imperium. In many respects it is unsurprising given the violent horrors that exist within the dark future of the 41st millennium. It also though stands as a reminder that while there are many terrors out among the stars of the galaxy, humanity is never far from inflicting upon itself its own inhumanity. For all its glory within the survival of mankind remains an undeniably dark side. Something which for all its advancement during the Golden Age, its subsequent fall and then stubborn refusal to be extinguished, the dark side of the human soul is something that is seemingly forever present.